Today, I wanted to introduce you to Daniel Askew. He is the founder of Living Tennessee in Nashville. Thank you for coming on, Daniel. Hello, hello. How's everyone <laughs> doing today? So Daniel actually um, is a member of Thrive, and he's one of the leaders in Thrive. And so um, just to, I'll give you a little bit of background. I'll let Daniel kind of give you a uh, an idea of what his team looks like this year, um, what he what he uh, intends, how he intends to grow his team this year, and more importantly, where you can send some referrals. How do you like that? <laughs> we love referrals. That sounds excellent. I love it. So basically, Daniel has um, sold to over twenty three hundred families. Have has sold over three hundred and seventy five million plus in volume. Okay, he's an expert in um, marketing. He's an expert in his area. And so, Daniel, tell us a little bit about um, where you're located, what your what size, what your team size is, if you're looking for um, team members, and where we can send some referrals before you get started into get local. All right. Well, uh, thanks everybody for being on this call. It still amazes me that people would actually show up to hear what I have to say. So I'm uh, very grateful. And so our team right now um, on our real estate company, we've got, I think, 29 agents. And then we've got, I don't know, maybe another 10 to 12 in support staff. Uh, we uh, are, yes, we're all growing. We're always looking to partner with great people. Uh, last year, we started a mortgage company. Uh, two years ago, uh, we bought a landscaping business. Um, and now we're kind of launching um, a marketing agency. And then we've got a couple of other ventures. So I guess the best way to describe me is just, I'm an entrepreneur. I love business. It's my hobby. It's my sport. And uh, I'm grateful for everything the real estate business has got me. Um, some of the people who started the Thrive Network were business partners of mine in another venture called Five Doors. So um, yeah, we're here and um, excited. And um, <clears throat> I guess just to kind of frame out today's conversation, uh, we've started to build uh, a marketing agency, which is something that was a lot of learning for me. And uh, I had some really cool partners here locally that we decided to build around. And so this is really just kind of about what, uh, why I started that journey, what I've learned so far, and hopefully we'll give you some ideas. Um, I've posted in the chat here, some links to some different documents that we're going to go over while we're chatting. But all I ask in return you know, I spent a good bit of time putting this together is I would love for this to be a conversation. So please stop me with questions. If I'm sitting here talking to myself the whole time, it's not quite as much fun. I'd rather kind of dive deep and go vertical on things that um, makes uh, more sense to you guys. So can we all just agree that you'll stop, ask questions. I'll do my best to monitor the chat and like, let's make this worthwhile for you. Yeah. Can I get some thumbs up or some yeses? All, yes. right. All right. And this is Daniel. Um, I love that you mentioned that you want to have a conversation. This is why I encourage people, if we're going to have a conversation and have a coach like Daniel on, that we are on camera, right? Because it's hard to have a conversation when we are not on camera. So we don't care what you guys look like. We just want to engage and make sure that you guys are getting what you need. And more importantly, Daniel, uh, we are um, valuing his time. And so, Daniel, before you get in, the biggest thing is, is, you know, everybody has questions on, you know, where should I find new lead sources? Um, some people will never pick up the phone. They're never going to prospect, right, and lead generate um, like they need to. And that's why I found, you know, bringing you on is teaching them to be the local expert is another way of uh, getting themselves out there and maximizing their reach. Yeah, that's very well said. And that's actually why this whole thing has come about. So I'm, I've am i never been a phone prospector. Um, I'm good. I'm good with the phone, but I've got a whole process on how I, I get those phone calls. And, you know, we came from kind of the Keller Williams teaching, which is prospecting based and marketing enhanced. And and to a degree, I, I in, in certain industries, I do believe that that is true. And so what I took that when we were building our company and training, you know, agents, 
is that, you know, you got a prospect. And the the, the challenge is that uh, as salespeople um, and dealing with consumers in today's market is I think it's changed. And so we ignored marketing for many years, didn't really do a lot on social. I mean, we had good social accounts, focused more on recruiting, teaching people scripts. And what I've realized is one, you know, energy and willpower are not on will call. And and as a salesperson, sometimes I feel like picking up the phone and sometimes I don't. And the challenge with only prospecting is that when you don't have that energy, nothing's happening in your business. And so we made a conscious decision on our team to, to really swing the pendulum on the marketing side because I, th- I think that consumer behavior now is that people aren't going to pick up the phone. They're not going to schedule an appointment until they've checked you out. And you need to, you need to appear to be no, uh, they want to know you, they want to like you, and they want to trust you based on the content that you're putting online. And if you've got good digital assets and you're telling your story online, the amount of people that pick up the phone just all of a sudden goes up. And people really want to, I mean, think about when you buy products. Typically, what the way I do it is I'm going to go out and do all the research. I'm pretty much going to sell myself and look at all the different options, read as much as I can read. And when I reach out to a salesperson or I finally return a call, I'm pretty much sold. And I think that that uh, has a lot to do with where real estate is right now. <clears throat> People are convincing themselves to buy or sell. And they're they're not really ready to talk to an agent until they've looked online. And they're like, you know what? That guy seems fun or that guy seems smart or man, she seems like she's got her act together. So my encouragement as we kind of dive into this is <clears throat> you got to start somewhere. The what I'm about to show you guys is probably going to be a little overwhelming. Um, however, I believe that you grow into the conversations around you. And so I want to teach you kind of uh, have a North star on where you're going. And, and then at the end, we can kind of talk specifics on what to do next. Does that sound good? So I'm going to share my screen. And Tanya, if you could confirm that. Looks like you're starting to share. Yep, we can see your screen. All right, let's see here. Get this thing to present. I don't love PowerPoints that much. So I really, I really, uh, really just did this for you guys. All right. Can you see Thank you my so screen? Much. PowerPoint is very. <laughs> challenging sometimes and I appreciate your time putting this together. All right. All right. I'm going to label this do as the locals do. So do you know why Airbnb is so popular? I'll give you a couple of guesses. It's because when you travel, you know, the hotel industry feels like you're doing something else, but a lot of people when they travel, they really want to they really want to feel and experience that area as if a local uh was there. So I think and a lot of where I get my inspiration is um, <clears throat> how do I, uh, from a consumer standpoint, what do they really uh, deserve? And yes, we can do business. Um, hold on just a second. <laughs> Somebody turned the lights off in my office. <laughs> that got dark real quick. Okay. So consumers, um, consumers deserve somebody who's got local knowledge, right? And if you're thinking about how do I separate myself from the pack, I think that um, displaying local knowledge and, and, and letting them know that you care and you're embedded in the communities that you serve, that that is the way to really get people to trust you over an agent who's not from the area. We do deals all the time in areas that we don't live in. But if you're thinking about your prospecting and where your business is going to come from, I think you need a stool needs three to four legs. And one of those legs, if you're really going to build a long-term sustainable business, needs to come from uh, <clears throat> the choosing a community to serve. I personally think it's best to do it either where you live or where you want to live. And if you do it the right way over time, that becomes, 
I would say 30 to 50% of your business is building your sphere around a specific community. <clears throat> so I'm going to title this Do As The Locals Do, and then we'll get rolling here. All right. So... This is actually the first time I've used Canva presentation, so I'm learning uh, as we go here. So where do the locals hang out? Um, so if you were to define your area of expertise, how would you define it? Do you live in a city? Do you live in a neighborhood? Do you live in a specific community? And where, if, if I were to say, okay, Charlotte, you are officially a local. So we live in Nashville, Tennessee. Most of the people that live here are not from here. And um, as a result, you know, it's it's hard to say, like, you're only local if you grew up here, because frankly, most people who live in our city have been here less than three years, but they want to be a part of the community. <clears throat> and really, our job is to help them get ingrained in the community. So how would you describe what a local is in your area? And if somebody were to say, hey, like, you're a local or you're an expert, what would they actually do? Okay. And so I'm going to challenge you here to really think through like what, what would, um, if you were to do a research project, and in fact, this will be your first action item. I want you guys to start a document. Um, I would suggest doing it in a spreadsheet and start a tab for every area of town that you serve. And then as you grow your business and you learn different things about an area, go and drop them in your research document. And that way, if somebody calls and they say, hey, I want to buy a home in Murfreesboro, then you can easily just say, oh, pull up my document. Oh, did you know this school here? Do you know this person owns this business? And you can really just uh, quickly start talking like you're a local. Uh, but you want to be the go-to expert for your community. And I think what I envision there is, you know, if I'm at a restaurant and somebody says, hey, uh, you know, I'm thinking about living in uh, Green Hills in Nashville. I'm raising my hand. I'm like, hey, I'm your guy. Like, I literally know more about that area. I know more about the people. I know more about the history than anyone because I put the time in to learn it. So what, is that, what does that look like for you? So I think step one is doing the research. And before we kind of get into area specifics, I want to challenge you guys to redefine your personal brand. And as I've learned about um, a lot of social media lately is the algorithms on social media really favor personal brands over company pages. And so for years, I've somewhat hid behind my company brand. And so I would communicate as Living TN instead of as Daniel Askew. And for me, it was more comfortable to do it that way. But as I've learned, the, the algorithms now, especially on Facebook and, and Twitter and really on LinkedIn, they somewhat bury the company pages, but they really amplify the personal brands that support um, the company pages. So as, as uncomfortable as it is for me to put myself out there and kind of have this personal brand, like if I said, which brand is bit bigger? Virgin Airlines or Richard Branson? Which one would you guys think would like, which one pops in your head first? Richard Branson. Right. And, and he's actually got a great documentary on HBO that talks about how he built his personal brand that then made Virgin Airlines and made his other companies wildly popular. Now he was doing a uh, hot air balloon flights across the world and over, over ocean. So I don't recommend that. Um, you know, don't, don't put that on me, but there's other ways to do that. So the first thing I want you to do is go back and think about what is my personal brand? How do I describe myself? What do I stand for? What do I not stand for? And if consumers were to tell a story about me, what is the story that I want them to tell? The next thing I want to talk about, and we'll kind of go dig deeper into each of these is how do you curate your information flow? So once I've identified, okay, this is who I am and this is kind of who I want to be, then I got to figure out like, what am I consuming? And make no mistake that a lot of thoughts that we have, most of those are not original thoughts. What you consume 
influences your thoughts. So think of your consumption as upstream and your consumption of information flows downstream into your thought processes and into your actions. So I want to give you guys some tools to uh, really curate, like, what is your information flow? <laughs> like, what are, what are you listening to? What are you watching? What is on your brain diet? And then the next thing I want to talk about is how do you define your audience? You know, if you were to, if you were to name the characteristics of your ideal client avatar, you know, what would that be? Uh, where do they live? What does it smell like? Where do they hang out? What do they talk about? And then more importantly, what problems do they need help solving? So when you start getting into the content game, I think one of the easiest ways to think about it is, you know, what fascinates you and how do you take Take your own passions and your own curiosity to then turn around and solve problems for other people, right? So we'll talk about audience defining. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is, okay, if I'm going to, um, if I'm going to be with them, right? Have you ever walked into a restaurant and you're like, oh, I'm with them, right? Like what are some of the specific market knowledge that you would want to know? So I'll share some ideas with you. And then I'd love to hear some of your feedback. Sound good? All right. So market knowledge. Tell me the history of the neighborhood. Ooh. Have you ever just Googled, you know, history of Nashville, history of X, and just really read? And maybe, you know, the other thing you got to think about with the internet is there's a lot of biased information and a lot of, <clears throat> there's a lot of spin. So anytime I'm looking for great info, I really want to look and at different sources to make sure that I'm getting different perspectives and then I'm going to come up with my own, uh, I'm going to come up with my own interpretation of that data, but don't only trust one source. That would be my, <laughs> my, my encouragement for this entire conversation. But tell me the history about that area, because I can tell you that if I'm working with a buyer and this actually happened uh, recently and they're driving around with me, like I know who lives where. I know what buildings used to be what, like, I know this area was big in this war and all that doesn't necessarily make me a real estate expert, but what it does is it makes them feel comfortable that man, anything that happens, this guy knows about. I think the role of a real estate agent is to be the ambassador of the community that you serve, right? You want to be the local economist of choice, but you also want people to think like, Hey man, if I move here, like, I want to be friends with my agent. Like, he knows everybody and he knows things that are going on. And if you can just put in those little, I don't think you need to be able to recite, you know, a four-page document of the history. So what I do is I'll I'll read a lot. I'll write out bullet points that I think are important. And then I just memorize my bullet points. So I've just got, I've got talking points that I throw into conversations and it's just me trying to sound smart, but it makes people feel comfortable that they're moving somewhere where they've got somebody that's knowledgeable. So what are the major industries? Like, do you know the top three industries in your area? How, how much uh, money do they bring in? So for us, we've got uh, tourism is about a $40 billion industry. We've got uh, healthcare, which is around $30 billion. And then we've got music that's around 15 to $20 billion. So if I were to ask you the area that you serve the most, do you know who's hiring? Do you know what the major industries are? Like, what are those economic drivers of the area? Because obviously that plays into where people can work, how much money they can make, and is the area healthier than other areas? So um, obviously people always want to talk about an overview of the home values, um, I think it's important to memorize some key stats every month. So um, can you talk about the price per square foot of an area? And can you talk about the absorption rate? Now, the absorption rate is how many homes are selling every single month um, so that you can basically tell people that you've got a 2.1% supply. And what that means, Mr. Client, is that if every if there was no new construction, that every single home would be sold in the next 2.1 months. And I like using the 0.1 or the 0.6 or the 0.7 because it just shows people that I really care about my craft. And, and, and what other agent is going to be able to spout off that information? So I'll give you a little trick is before every single appointment, 
um, that I meet with someone. I sit down and I review my stats, right? I highlight my talking points. And then I'm going to write down a list of questions I want to ask them. And that really helps me with my confidence. And that way I'll sit there and I'll visualize what questions do I think they're going to ask me? What are my answers going to be? And what questions do I want to ask them? So if you just take another, just take an additional, you know, 15 to 30 minutes and just review your stats, review your talking points, and then make a list of questions you want to ask the customer, I guarantee your meetings will go a lot more favorably. So um, anybody want to stop me, come off mute, any questions so far? Okay, so you said you you go for these resources. What do you find to be the better resources? Do you start with Google and then work your way out? Do you hit the newspapers, local magazines, all of the above? <laughs> yeah, um, frankly, it is all of the above. And that it kind of goes back into the conversation about mastering your information flow. So every day, um, I'll give you guys a couple nuggets. I read national economic news and then I read local economics. So the national stuff, uh, Morning Brew. Uh, Morning Brew is a free newsletter that you can read every single morning. Um, and it talks about stocks and, and bonds and businesses. And it's just a quick... So I'm a big fan of really good newsletters, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about. And then I'm going to read the local. Um, I don't purchase like what's called the Tennessean, which is just kind of a, you know, a flashy news thing. But I love the business journal. Each of you should have a business journal in your area. Um, I would highly recommend subscribing to that. So I've got a series of newsletters that I curate. And then I've got my business journal. And then I use Twitter to uh, curate <clears throat> different influencers in the topics that I want to talk about. <clears throat> so we'll talk more about Twitter, but um, I'm also listening to podcasts. So once you, uh, once you first identify, okay, like I need to master my flow, then you can go back and think, okay, what am I currently reading and listening to? And then think about what do I need to read and listen to? So business journal, morning brew, and then just play around. Like what are some, maybe some national things, um, you know, that again, you're just looking for nuggets. No one's going to sit there and expect you to know everything, but I do see my role, especially as a team leader is to help people with shortcuts. So I go do all the reading so that my team doesn't have to, Right. So I'm going to bring information to my team and information to my clients that I know most likely they don't have time to read. So I'm a shortcut. Right. I want to be a shortcut for my consumers. Good question. Um, so let's go back to some research. What types of homes are in the area that you want to serve? And again, all this has a greater purpose, but be very granular. And as you learn this stuff, like over time, like this, this could be a 90 day project that you could like literally feel hundred percent different about an area in, in a very short amount of time. But what types of homes, uh, what are their design style? When were most of the homes built in your area? Um, so in my area, most of the homes were built in the fifties and they were ranch style. There was this guy named Kelly and they built Kelly built homes. Uh, a lot of new construction in my area. Um, a new house in my neighborhood now costs a minimum of $700 a square foot. New construction is $1,000 a square foot. Lord have mercy. But that's this type of stuff you should be able to just spout off when people bring it up. So uh, what are the most popular neighborhoods within that city? So if I said, um, hey, uh, hey, Charlotte, what are the three like new construction areas? Like what are the three of the new neighborhoods in your area? Could you tell me what they are? Do you know what the condo buildings are? I would suggest like in your research document, list out all the condo buildings. And if you really want to niche down, like understand what are the amenities, how much does the HOA cost? And if somebody ever called you up and says they want to buy a condo, then you've got all that information in one place. That would be really valuable for them. Uh, what are the school options? Obviously, uh, you know, schools are really important. And there used to be a mayor um, in Nashville, his name was Carl Dean, and it got a little bit annoying, but every single speech, he would always, he would always weave in the same three things in that every area, every area for growth and health has three factors. It's economic development, public safety, and public schools. 
and the three are very intertwined. So if you've got all three of those things, the area grows. If you're missing one, it grows a little less. If you're missing two, it grows a little less. So it's all intertwined. So understanding that about your area, can you talk intelligently about the public schools? Have you ever met one of the principals? Have you talked to some of the teachers? Um, you know, obviously you can go read greatschools.org and, and, you know, and, and assume your consumer's there. But if you can connect your consumer with one behind the scenes, right, or one local person who can speak highly to schools, it makes you look a lot smarter. So do you know if there's a new school being built in your area? Um, I think that's pretty, pretty valuable information as well. Um, do you know what kind of birds and plants are in your area? Anybody? My wife would make really good fun of me, but I counted last week that I've got 14 species at my bird feeders. You know, we've got cardinals and we've got sparrows and we've got doves and we've got uh, bluebirds, you know, and I know how to attract those birds because I learned that in my habitat, here's what these birds kind of eat. So you, you're probably thinking this guy's crazy, but I had a client a couple of weeks ago that called me and they were really into birds. And so when we were looking at houses, I was telling them, hey, do you know they really wanted cardinals? Well, cardinals need um, evergreen trees and they like um, they like sunflower seeds and they'll also eat sapphire. So we had a whole conversation about birds. I also know what kind of plants are in my area. I got really into gardening uh, through the pandemic, bought a landscaping company, learned all about the natural trees in my area. So just giving you some granular ideas here. But I guarantee you, if you were able to talk about native plants in an area, you are a freaking local. <laughs> Thank you, Kay. <laughs> Nature is key. Uh, very good. Very good. Who are your local leaders? This one was a little struggle for me because it's obviously there's always a lot of turnover. But have you ever met your council person? Do you know who they are? Um, I don't think, you know, you have to choose sides necessarily. It's it's funny how our society one day when you say a political affiliation, all of a sudden you get associated with a bunch of other things that it doesn't mean. So meet leaders from both sides, you know, be a part of the conversation um, for development in your area and growth and, and be a part of that community. Obviously, you want to respect people from different sides of, of, your, pers of your perspective, but it's important to know that your council member is there for you. And if they know your name, like imagine meeting someone out at a restaurant like you're meeting with a new client and the council member walks by and you say, oh, well, this is the guy that runs our whole district. Like that's going to make you absolutely look different than every other agent. Um, what are the sports networks? What I mean by that is, so in Nashville, we have the Nashville Sports League, which is kickball, dodgeball, volleyball for adults. They got flag football, but there's also stuff for kids. And I don't know what the percentages are, but a lot of people either have kids or want to have kids. So if you can speak to, hey, well, if you buy a home in this area, they've got this Green Hill Sports League and there's 20 teams in this sport and here's how much it costs. Those little research details are going to make you really seem um, really seem smart. So I won't I won't bore you to death with more of this, but this one's really important. What are the major social media groups? Most of these are on Facebook, but if you went to an area, <clears throat> what I would do is just type in different variables into Facebook and find those groups. A lot of information goes to the group. Sometimes it's just complaining, but sometimes it's local businesses promoting themselves. And then you can figure out who are the players here? What are the needs of the community? What are the, you know, what's kind of the fabric? What are the conversations? And then you just dive right in, try to be helpful. And um, I'll give you just a little tip. I call it the 10, 10, 10, which is, you know, you don't want to waste all day on social media, but anytime you get on, like 10 comment, like 10 posts, make 10 comments and send 10 private messages. So if you jump into one of these Facebook groups that's around your area. So in, in Tennessee, we have Hip Nashville, Hip Antioch, Hip Mount Juliet. You probably have some of those there. It's a lot of work to start your own, but if there's an opportunity, I would consider it. Um, but if you go in and you start commenting and you start liking things, then the algorithms, it's ba you're basically telling the algorithm that you want to be a part of that. 
So those groups are going to show up on your feed more and you're going to show up on the people that you're liking, the people that you're commenting. And then all of a sudden you're going to look like someone who they should know as well. So 10 likes, 10 comments, 10 direct messages in 10 minutes. Doesn't that sound yeah, no, I have something to add to that. Go ahead. Um, Y'all, this actually works. When I was in Colorado Springs, I managed a Keller Williams office of like I don't know, 127 agents and they were all uh, mega agents and um, top producers. Like they were selling 60, 70, 80, 100, 300 homes. They um, weren't paying for any advertising. They all got started with Facebook groups and they were very strategic about how many groups they were in and they weren't just in one they were in a lot of different groups um and um basically grew their name there so that works big time so daniel yeah absolutely go ahead can you tell him the best way because because what i advise them to do is just basically go to facebook and put in the name of their town or their city and then you go to groups and then you see all the groups neighborhood pages and groups and everything. And then you just like them there. What would your strategy be for that? Yeah. So one, I I personally think like my Facebook is my CRM, you know, and I use it for research. I use it as a way to connect with people. And so the groups, if I were you, I would join all of them. I mean, I've got, I don't know, hundreds that I'm a part of now. It will clutter up your feed, but what's more important? like having a simple Facebook feed or having a feed that gives you inspiration and mm -hmm. that gives you talking points and allows you to connect with other people. So I was one of those guys that was too cool for school. I posted one time in 10 years of having a Facebook account. I just was like, oh, I'm not going to do that. My friends are going to make fun of me. And then there was a turning point where I just said, like, it's critical for my career to uh, get more engaged with social. And so I, I have no shame. If I meet you, like I'm going to friend request you on Facebook. It's really not so I can check you out. It's more about you checking me out. Right. Which, which kind of goes back to the, the conversation earlier about figuring out what your personal brand is. And I would encourage you all to do an audit after this call and, or, or have a friend do an audit and just like, what do your current social media channels tell the story about? You know, do you have like a three-story beer funnel on there or like, does it show you with your kids or, you know, what are you into? And if you're a little too private, you're probably missing opportunities. So, I mean, if you've got an Instagram feed that people have to like follow you first before they can see your stuff, I would encourage you to maybe make it not private because again, consumer behavior is they want to come and check you out. So maybe you don't share all your stuff to the public, but on Facebook, there's, you know, ways to, to show certain pictures and they need to see you like doing things in the community, shaking hands with people, smiling, taking care of your family and doing real estate deals. So the number one thing, like I'm kind of getting ahead here, but <laughs> the number one thing that gets reach on social is what I like to call you being the host of MTV Cribs. <laughs> it's you going out and showing property and going into nice homes and taking videos of that, that, that gets more reach than anything. So just, just remember that. Ah, uh, I love that. Okay. So can I just add to that really quickly? Sure. So a lot of people are wondering like, what do I post? And so we keep saying you guys got to post and you guys have to um, let people know that you're a realtor and you're not an undercover agent. And then we talk about video and a lot of people are afraid to get on video. You guys should have one day of the week that you are previewing property. What that means, you pull up your list, you see what new homes are out there and that gives you a video. So exactly what he said, I didn't know, Daniel, that that gets like the biggest reach, but you should have one day to show people, pick some really yeah. nice homes. I love that. Yeah. Well, it, I would, I would recommend going to people within your brokerage first. Like if you don't have your own listing, go to people in your brokerage and offer to do just a free promotional video. Like most people won't say no to that. However, you definitely want to get permission because imagine if you're a home seller and they see your video on Instagram of you going through their home without permission, 
it could get a little weird, but people are doing that. The other thing is just send an email. If it's outside of your brokerage, like if I got an email as a listing agent, it said, you know, Hey Daniel, this is Tanya. I, I noticed your listing and by God, that's the most beautiful home in this whole area. Would you be open if I came over and did a little promotion to my audience about your listing and potentially bought you a buyer? Right. So that's different than just trying to show up and scheduling a preview and not telling people what you're doing. So just think about that because it is a little bit of a hot topic. But I, if if someone came to me and they're like, hey, can I go promote your listing? Like, freak, go for it. Like, absolutely. So well, then what also, else? if you don't want to, if you don't get permission, you could. And how, how do you feel about this, Daniel? I say, if you if you go and look at properties, you can also do a quick video just on the outside of the property, right? Hey, you guys, I just showed yeah. this showed this beautiful home in Brentwood, whatever, Nashville, three bedrooms, four baths, whatever, three baths, um, showing the outside of the home. How do you feel about that? It's still, it's showing you in your zone, right? Just remember, most people want to look at the homes, not you, um, even though you're all beautiful, uh, but you demonstrating that you know how to do your job. And and where it really hit home for me is when I, I started trying to learn YouTube, which is a freaking animal. But I, I was doing some research and one at this one post that had like 12 million views in my area. And it was literally just an agent that he was friends with the homeowner and they had a cool house and they just did a tour and he, they told him about their house. It wasn't even for sale um, at the time. And like so many people watched that. So rehab projects, luxury homes, unique homes, um, all that stuff gets a great, great reach. Does that make sense? So uh, before we move on, um, I'd love for you guys, I, I want to kind of hit back on the brand identity. Um, and and bring your attention to a document that's in the chat. Um, in fact, it's labeled uh, brand identity exercise. Can you give me a couple of thumbs up? Do you see it in the chat? All right. It may be because... Hold on one second. Copy link. Is it the content game plan or is it? I put three documents in there. I think sometimes if if you post before people uh, actually log on. All right. No, I can see it. I can see it. Brand identity. It's 1159. All right, I just post. I just post it again. So pull up, uh, pull up that document. So this is something that I put together for our team. And it's. It, 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 it's deep. It's deep. But I would love to encourage you guys as an action item over the next 90 days to go and fill this out. You don't have to share with anybody. This is a conversation inside of just between you and yourself. But these are really important questions to ask because <clears throat> this course is about how do you, how are you a digital mayor of your area and how do you turn the local expertise into sales? And what you have to remember when you start building your content is you don't need to sell everybody. You don't need to boil the ocean. People are going to want to work with you just the way you are. Like that's really important. People are going to want to work with you just the way you are. So you don't necessarily have to be somebody else. <clears throat> so you first need to kind of have a conversation as far as what is my brand identity. The couple of things I want to point out are what are some of the philosophies that have impacted your adult life? Because these, these types of things are what's going to attract people of like mind. And as you go out and you spend time and you're in the community, uh, knowing who thyself is first is going to really become the magnet for like why other people want to spend time with you. And you're always going to work with some people that are not like you, and that's great. But if we're talking about like really building a leg of your business, <clears throat> the easiest thing to do first is birds of a feather flock together. Like when you have a common interest point with somebody else, like you're both like birds, you both like plants, you both like an air, whatever that is, put that out there first off like very authentically. And the algorithms within the social media um, channels, <clears throat> they're going to suggest others to like you who have those similar interests. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the other thing I want to uh, point out 
is what's exciting to you about being a real estate agent? And I wrote that specifically because I think it's important for you to be happy. <laughs> Nobody wants to work with a downer, right? We have this one friend, we call her the fun sponge. She's not allowed on the boat because she takes every conversation and makes it about her and she's pessimistic. And it's like, if somebody wants to buy a home, they think it should be like HGTV. There should be a property brother there and it's going to be fun and exciting. And you're going to look at three homes in 25 minutes and pick one. But you want to portray to others that when they work with you, you're not only competent, but you're going to create an amazing experience that they can go and tell their friends about. So really, really important. But so what's the most exciting thing about real estate? Um, and then the other thing um, I think is important is to really identify like what are your tribes? Because you can start to segment your message down by tribes. And the tribe can be really anything that you think of. Like now I'm really kind of a Twitter guy. So I've got my tribe on Twitter. Right. I like the Titans football. So I've got kind of my tribe of people that like football. Um, I've got my friends who are really into the outdoors and boating. So I've kind of got this boating tribe. Then the Thrive Network, like this is one of my tribes. I'm also in Tom Ferry coaching. That's one of my tribes. So sit, sit down and really think like, who are your current tribes? Do you need to add anything to that? But it's really going to help one, you go, man, I've got like more groups than I thought. And then you can really reflect on like, how does this group influence me and my thoughts? Um, and then you can also tailor your message across different channels to that tribe. Does that make sense? Simplest thing to do would be to go after you identify who your tribes are and what influences you, then go to your CRM and just tag it. So I've got all my Titans friends that we tailgate with. I've got my boating friends. I've got kind of my business contacts. I've got my wife's friends. All that's in my CRM that I can go back and <clears throat> create custom messages for. You can also create friend lists like within different social media accounts and really speak to specific tribes when you want to. So what you're that? saying is that, you know, having the COVID pandemic mindset of staying in your house and not socializing probably isn't serving you very well anymore, is it? Well, probably not. <laughs> we all went through it, but I do, I definitely think that that, that probably got me to this point where I've really tried to focus on marketing and, and really the, where this whole conversation came from is that some people are, haven't left the house yet and they're doing their research online and they're checking you out and it's not a creepy thing. It's just people are looking for connection points and that's what you should do too. It's, Hey, this guy has a kid too person. He lives in this area. That's somebody I want to network with. So yeah, you still are going to have to prospect, but the reason kind of owning your social content is important is every now and then it's going to have an exponential return. So I know that when I call someone, I can have a one-to-one -one conversation, right? It puts me in the driver's seat and there is metrics on turning that into business. But if I spend a little time every week building a great digital presence, some point people are just going to start reaching out to me. And I'm not suggesting that you need to be Instagram famous to get value from it. In fact, I was on a coaching call uh, with Tom Ferry's group this morning. And they this one guy mentioned he's he's been doing videos for a year. And he said that and uh, Tom asked him, he said, well, are you getting people like in your DMs and people are just calling you because of your videos? And he said, no. He goes, well, why are you doing them? He goes, because when I go to someone's house, I'm getting more yeses because they've already looked me up. Like they already trusted me before I got there. So what is your brand? <clears throat> what is your message, right? How are you mastering your information flows to basically put your content out there and then just wait and let's, let's see who, who it attracts. <clears throat> well, Make you sense? never know what video is going to catch on, right? It, Absolutely. You put your videos there. I've been putting videos for five or eight years. I put a heart surgery video on my journey from heart surgery on YouTube. And I just looked, it got 10,000 views. Does that help my uh, coaching business or my real estate business? Yeah, it does. Because now they're on my channel looking at other things. 
Yes. So let's talk about uh, agreed, right? And I, you and I related through that video. When the first time you and I had a conversation, I was frenzied on Facebook for like six months. We'd never talked. And the first thing I asked you when we talked was like, how's how's the recovery going? Like I already knew what was important to you. And I was able just to jump right in to talk about that. So um, I'm going to share my screen again. Can everybody see that? All right. So anything else on what a local would know? And the the best way to think about this is if 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 you were moving to a new area, what would your expectations be of the agent that you hired? Now, we all know you can do deals without high expectations, but this calls about being the best, right? We always want to be the best. So what what would those questions be? Does anybody have an idea? What Anything we haven't talked about yet? The other like quick point was understanding the local festivities. Like, do you live in the catfish capital of the world? Do you have a fish fry every June 3rd? Like, what are kind of those local things that everyone goes to, the festivals, the concerts, those reoccurring events. Um, and you can easily find those in like area newsletters. Another little trick is every time I go to a restaurant and they've got those free giveaway newsletters, I always read them. And, and even if I'm in other cities, I always read them. I'm looking for ideas for marketing, but I also just want to hear like what the heck is going on. So highlights, talking points, my wife makes fun of me. Why do you read that? Well, you know, somebody's going to bring it up one day and I'm going to have a one-liner that's going to make me sound smart. Anything else? All right, we'll come back to that. All right, so how the heck do, what do I talk about online? And like, where do I start? So this is a process called Build in Public. And if anyone here is on Twitter, um, Elon Musk is really doing this at a high level, you know, if you want an example. But the idea is that as a creator, you want to learn, you want to grow, you want to share your growth, and then you want to repeat the process. So learn, grow, share, repeat. So remember that you guys are all entrepreneurs, right? People are, I guess obsessed a little bit, maybe fascinated is a better word with the lifestyle of a real estate agent. You know, there's a reason why HGTV is so popular. And if you're ever wanting to kind of catch up on your language patterns, like go watch some of the good shows on HGTV or DIY. And if you're, I mean, if you're really trying to up your skill game and just listen, like how do those top agents uh, describe things to clients? How do they do showings? Like what are some of those nuggets? because they're doing a lot of research and the shows are, are very specific to an audience. So HGTV is popular because we have celebrators. I like to say like people are interested in homes. Everyone has real estate in their life plan at some point. So um, if you were to just say, okay, I'm going to start this journey. I actually just did this. So I'm, I'm not telling you anything <laughs> I wouldn't do. I started on Twitter and I was like, Hey, Twitter, here I am. Like, I'm going to start sharing. And the whole process is, how am I building my business? Like, what is the ups and downs of my daily? Like, what inspired me that day? I, my audience, I'm really going towards other entrepreneurs. But if you put out great business content and just a regular consumer sees that, they're going to assume that you know what you're talking about in your area. You don't want to only talk about the good stuff. Sometimes you got to talk about the struggle. And then what you've done to overcome the struggle. And man, that stuff has juice. Like you will get more comments on, man, lost a client today. I, I went into the appointment and I didn't do enough homework and another agent got the deal. Man, that hurt. But here's what I'm going to do next time. Have you guys ever lost a, a client? Right. And you share that story. That's what's going to draw in the audience. <clears throat> but the hard part is the consistency. So in each social media um, platform, <clears throat> the algorithms reward consistently, consistency, right? So if you only post once a month, you're not going to get traction on anything. Frankly, you need to figure out how to post once a day on some of the platforms. But even if you start a cadence of once a week, 
and just do a good thoughtful post, that's going to go further than doing nothing. But um, share your journey, be vulnerable, right? And build in public. And what that does is your audience all of a sudden relates with like who you are and that he it's kind of that hero journey. You know, when you read about stories from, uh, from Camelot, right? As a kid, like people relate with stories and the better you are at sharing your story <clears throat> and telling the story of others. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Next time you have a closing, <clears throat> sit down with your client and do a quick video and you could just do it with your phone and just say, Hey, really thankful for your business. Tell me if you were going to give another person advice and how to buy a home in today's market, what would you tell them? And what that does is when you hear a story, it triggers something in your brain that you're the one going through it. So you ever notice that like when you're watching your favorite football team and they score a touchdown or they hit a home run, you get excited. It's because your brain is creating adrenaline as if you were there. So if you can really think about human psychology and mastering your storytelling, that's going to get you a lot further. So learn, right? You got to be committed to learning. My spirit animal is curious, George, right? Are you genuinely curious? Um, <clears throat> learn, grow, right? Let it affect you and then share, right? Learn, grow, share. Make sense? All right, so let's talk about distribution channels. So this could be probably where you will have a lot of questions. I will talk kind of high level on these topics. And if you want to go deeper on any of them, then, then stop me. I am watching the chat. So I put these a little bit in order of what I think is mostly critical and what you can implement the fastest. So number one would be your newsletter or just like your email distribution list. So remember that what the social media platform giveth, it can also taketh. And, you know, people, um, you know, all the platforms have rules. Sometimes your account can be suspended for with no notice. Sometimes the algorithms change. And I, I want you to think that your whole business doesn't revolve around like your Facebook page, right? And it doesn't just revolve around your YouTube You've got to implement somehow owning your newsletter, right? So that can take a lot of forms, but people would argue that a thousand subscribers on a newsletter is equal to a million followers on TikTok. So just let that sink in, right? Thousand subscribers on your newsletter is equal to a million or more on TikTok. And the reason is because you're speaking, one, you own the content, you're speaking directly to a specific audience. And even though TikTok is really all the rage right now, because people are bragging about their views and their reach, it's still very difficult to monetize it, right? So I'm not saying don't do it, but you've got to figure out like, who's your sphere first? owning that direct either weekly or monthly communication before you start putting all your eggs in just the social basket. Uh, Tanya, did you have a question? Nope. I was just going to say every one of you has KV Core and you can create newsletters for free in KV Core. Use your systems. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll take this moment to suggest reading a book, Who Not How by Dan Sullivan. Who Not How by Dan Sullivan. Um, Who Not How is a classic for an entrepreneur because it means that uh, sometimes your procrastination is your genius and it's telling you that you're trying to do something you're not wired to do. So uh, all of these things can be outsourced and many of them at a very cheap cost. I mean, you could get someone on Fiverr or a college intern. I, I built our company off interns story for another day, but we used to have five at a time. Um, there's a lot of uh, leveraged resources now in the real estate space through virtual assistants. So if you really want to figure this out, don't think that you've got to become a master copywriter. If you can come up with some bullet points or do a video a week or a video a month about your area or just like a market update, that's enough to create a newsletter. All right. But just think newsletter slash email list. Second is your web page and your blog. Now, 
this can be a big rabbit hole. Um, so hear me out on what I feel is important here. <clears throat> You're not going to beat Zillow on SEO. Like, frankly, none of us are probably going to be on page one on Google. That's not the point. The point is to have a storefront and a place to store your content when you make it and a place to promote great content when you make it. Um, so this is getting really technical, but I'll tell you a strategy. So a lot of people start to do YouTube, right? So we'll just kind of start talking about YouTube and they think, man, I got to make all these, you know, 50 videos or a hundred videos and I got to pump out videos every single week or YouTube's not going to think I'm serious. Well, what happens is you spend a lot of time on a lot of videos that don't matter. <laughs> what the pros will do is they they get, mm. you put out, let's say 10 videos. YouTube algorithmically will tell you which video is the hottest, right? The one that gets the most reach is what YouTube is saying like, hey, this audience likes this content from you. So you end up trying a bunch of different things, right? Say you make 10 videos or 15 videos and then one of them pops. Well, what you want to do is you take the one that pops and you promote it, which you can do through KV Core. It's just boosting the post, right? So you boost that one post that YouTube told you was hot. And then you use that anchor, that anchor video to draw people into your page and then when they come to your page, because that one video, then on the right side, they consume your other content. So I got a lot of blank stares. <laughs> Give me some feedback. Let's let's chat for a second. Come on, I know you got something to say. So basically, you're, I mean, I, don't, I actually missed some of that. So just basically are optimizing your, your. Right. So, okay. What I'm trying to say is you don't have to be, you don't have to set up a whole marketing company to do this. Well, what you need to do is find one or two things, maybe one or four things that you're comfortable with, that you're good at post regularly. When YouTube tells you you've got a hot video, you pay to promote that video, which means you're just basically boosting the post, right? And you're you're paying, which you could spend literally like 20 bucks or $30 to get thousands of views on that one video. So you put content out there uh, and you try different things until you find what sticks. And then when you find some that really sticks and that one video that pops, then you can basically promote that and it draws traffic back to your website. So- Again, don't go, if you, especially if you're a newer agent, don't spend a lot of time on website, but spend a little bit on it, right? Go, go through there. You can pay someone to write the content for you. We're not talking about a lot of money. There's even AI writing tools that you can find now. There's a lot of different options if you're willing to do the research. Make your storefront look good and just know that that's a place of promotion, but you're not trying to be an SEO expert. So SEO stands for search engine optimization. And um, I've played this game multiple times and, and got my tail kicked. Um, you do not have to be an expert and make this huge fancy website, but I do think just a little bit of attention, take a week to focus on it, maybe two weeks to focus on it, and then move on to the next thing. But your newsletter and your website, that's what you really can control. Does that make sense? So, so I have third, a client. Sorry, I have a client that did a um, video on a 1031 exchange. You guys can look her up, Sarah McKinney in Colorado Springs, and mm -hmm. that video got so much traction on like YouTube and Facebook, and she put it on Google My Business, and she got a couple listings from it because she saw yes. that was the video that was converting. Yep, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. So I just posted. Um, a content game plan for you here. And these are just some ideas that I wrote down um, that can give you some frameworks. But as Tanya alluded to, the easiest thing to think of is just to do FAQ videos. So as an agent, what do people typically ask me about an area? 
right? I'm, I'm still trying to turn my local expertise into sales. So talk about like, what do people typically ask me when they move into this area? Like, what are those key points and those key, you know, we talked earlier about like, here's all the info you should know. Video yourself talking about that. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, if you were going to give someone advice right now, like imagine that you're just coaching a buyer. Hey, Mr. Buyer, like in today's market, the most prepared person wins. You know, here are five steps that I tell every client to do in order to win. So the, there's a term called content marketing. And I'll put in the chat here, uh, um, see uh, contentmarketinginstitute.com. Now, this is some high level stuff. I believe you can also get there by cmi.com. The Content Marketing Institute is like the just the gold standard on, on what I'm trying to teach you. But essentially, content marketing is you provide, you share all your stuff, like all of your best info, everything you learn, you put it out there. You put the most valuable info that you have out to the public for free. That's what creates them to trust you and like you. And that's how you turn them into sales. Right. So content marketing, it's, it's a, probably a, you know, a little overplayed word, but very few people figure it out at a long scale, but by you putting out videos about FAQs, technically that is content marketing. So a couple other uh, quick nuggets on here before we move on. Cause I got a couple other things to share Google business profile. This one is gold. So this is Google's way of competing with social media. And it's essentially like when you type in, um, you know, best pizza place near me, Google wants to find what it deems as legit businesses geographically near you. So you can go set up this page really easily. You just need a business address. And it's Google's way of just kind of verifying that you are a legitimate business. And then if you post pictures of yourself, especially at your office, or when you're doing events, or just like anything in your head that you could think of, yeah, this makes me like seem legit. And you post that onto your Google business page, the reach is is exponential. Like we had, I won't bore you, but I was looking mine up the other day. I mean, it was like 3,800 searches in the last 30 days. Now, not all of that turns into closings for us, but just know that if you nail this profile, Google is going to promote you above your competition and people are just going to find you by searching for local stuff. So there's a lot more content out there on this, but I think it should be one of your top three priorities because it's the easiest to implement. Go ahead, Tanya. We just had two trainings on this and they're actually, Daniel, I should send it to you for your team. And Absolutely. basically two experts came on to talk about Google and this is exactly it and exactly what Daniel said, that should be one of your main content strategies. Um, so I kind of touched on what I wanted to say about YouTube. YouTube is, is a little overwhelming. So what I would recommend on YouTube is list out maybe 10 videos that you want to do, right? So you, you do want to start a page and you do want to commit to some type of cadence, whether it's weekly, monthly, quarterly, or whatever. Um, if you don't post frequently, you're not going to give yourself the best shot. So put your videos on YouTube, let YouTube algorithmically tell you what's hot, and then do what I like to call like a sub niche, and then go deeper underneath that topic, right? Um, but all of these things you can do better by just watching what else other people do. So remember earlier I said that um, what you consume upstream flows downstream. What most people are doing on social is they're copying what the influencers are doing. So I use, and I'll just kind of go back to Twitter now, highly, highly recommend you guys start a Twitter account. You don't have to be the best tweeter, <laughs> but what you can do with Twitter is follow follow influential thinkers and all the trends I believe start on Twitter, right? It's that instant news network essentially. And you can curate your feed based on who inspires you and really, really high level information. And so you basically use Twitter to figure out, okay, like this is about to be trending. 
<laughs> and then you run to YouTube and you run to TikTok and you copy what you saw on Twitter. So hear what I said there. Find people who are doing things that are popular. Go make it your own and rush to the other platforms. Facebook, in my opinion, is almost last on this list. Now, Facebook's critical in different ways, but it's not good to figure out what's trending. Twitter and Instagram. Now, Instagram, I think, is more for kind of, and I don't mean this in the wrong way, but more of the show-off community. Like, hey, look at me. Here's what I'm doing, right? Video is critical on all of these. Like, so you, you understand that video is hard, but it's also your opportunity to catch up with everybody else. So if you can start doing video now, you can pass by people who won't do it. Like it's the algorithms favor it so much that like, that's why we started doing it essentially. So um, Instagram, I don't think is a great business community. This is just my opinion. It's more fun. It's a little more flashy. It does have a role, but it's also, I would argue that, you know, a news, a newsletter is worth a certain amount of Instagram followers as well. So you would say like a thousand, <laughs> you know, a thousand people in your newsletter is worth maybe a half a million or a million on, on Insta. And a million on Insta is worth like 5 million on TikTok. Like that, that essentially is kind of how it's working. So Twitter is a great business community. Most people think of Twitter as like politics and like hatred and people calling each other out, but there's a term called Twitter money and the Twitter money community is really strong. People share really good stuff. There's a lot of content creators and there's a lot of founders on Twitter and a lot of different ways to get inspiration. So my wife is currently making fun of me by my Twitter comments to everyone around me. But Twitter is about to be in the game of long form video content. The reach on Twitter is, is much greater than on Facebook. So Facebook and Instagram, you pretty much have to pay for your reach. But on Twitter, like you can go out and get great content like almost instantly. So start a Twitter page. Really, really important. Be inspired. And then TikTok. Too much to go into right now. I think it's hard because, you, you know, you got to be catchy. So I would try to focus on some of these other things first. The one thing I will say on Facebook, again, I use Facebook. That's my CRM. It's it's kind of the easiest platform to have all of your friends and family in one place and with Facebook groups being really, really powerful. So you definitely need to pay attention to Facebook, but you get your ideas from Twitter and Instagram and YouTube. Does that make sense? And then next door in Reddit, Reddit's kind of an old school thing, but it's a great learning tool. So there's a lot of people posting like how to information. And then next door, um, the little trick I wanted to mention is um, one, you should be in next door <laughs> and just post something regularly and then ask a question like, hey, guys, I'm a real estate agent and I need a, a painter that serves Green Hills. Who do you recommend? And what will happen is all these local people will start putting their buddies and their painters. And every time someone posts something new and the threads will last quite a long time. But what is at the very top? Hey, I'm an agent in this area. All right. So next door is free. It's super easy. Um, you know, spend a half a day just kind of familiarizing yourself with it. But I think it's it's kind of a kind of a little nugget um, that's worthy of, of a little bit of attention. So before I move into kind of a five-step process, I've got two more slides, um, questions or just comments on distribution channels. Would love to hear a comment. You all promised that y'all are going to make a comment when we started this. So. I noticed like the younger crowd, like, because I'm only 23. So like the people that I know and went to high school with, they usually use Twitter and like TikTok more. But the Facebook, that's where you can reach like moms, uncles, grandpas, like your whole, like you said, more uh, your sphere of influence that way. Yeah. I mean, that's well said. And I don't want to overwhelm you guys, but I think you got to hit them at all the different channels. Like you meet people right. where they are, which group has more money? right? The, our, our moms on, you know, 
I'm 42, right? The my age and my parents or my 20 year old friends. So I think, you know, what you can do, there's a term and you can learn this on CMI, but you repurpose content, right? So you do one video shoot or you have one thought and then you repurpose that content and distribute it across the different channels. So you don't have to come up with something unique for each audience. Um, but I definitely think like if most of your friends are on Twitter, then be on Twitter, you know, um, really, I guess my encouragement would be maybe pick three and kind of have your primary distribution channel and then maybe one to two secondary channels. It's really overwhelming to learn all of them, but you could easily make a post, um, you know, for Facebook and then cut it down in half and post it on Twitter and then do a video of yourself about that post and put it on TikTok. So if you guys go back to the document I posted with your content game plan, just think I can take one topic, one FAQ, put my thought into it, and then chop up that same content and distribute across the different channels. There's a lot of different tools that can help you with that, but that way you're reaching a broad audience because frankly, like there is different audiences on each, on each platform. So why not post and extend your reach, right? Remember the goal here with social media marketing is exponential results. So why not post it? Don't overthink it. Just try to post frequently and then your quality is going to improve over time. Anybody well, else questions that, or thoughts on distribution? Yeah, so yes, about distribution, Daniel, um, there are companies that do that. You can pay them. You know, I know HubSpot and those kinds of things. I also have someone that can do that for you. You just post on one platform and it posts through all the platforms and gives you the analytics. So if you're interested, Absolutely. let me know. Absolutely. I mean, as entrepreneurs, everyone on this call, you know, maybe you're kind of stuck in first gear and you don't have a lot of revenue yet. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm empathetic to that stage. But if you guys are doing sales consistently and you're thinking like, where do I invest a small amount of dollars and less dollars, more time for exponential results, it would be in social, right? Like again, phone calls, one to one to one. But if I spent two hours a week trying to create some content that inspired me and then post, like you may get a thousand people or 2000 people that see it and you do that over time. And like all of a sudden someone's going to come to you and be like, Kai, I see you everywhere. Right. And they don't realize like all that content just for them, but they're going to think, man, like everywhere I go, I see her and she's active and she's clearly a successful agent. Like that's the perception. Right. So the other reason I got back to this marketing so important is I think it's the modern day way to build your sphere. So when I meet someone, I immediately go and, and add them on Facebook. And then that gets them into my funnel, right? Because then I can control a lot of what they're seeing about me or I'll go and follow them on, on tick or Instagram or whatever. And I'm making that connection point. And then it's up to me to engage, engage with their content. And hopefully they'll engage with mine. And this is the way that I'm building a deeper relationship. And you better believe that people are watching, right? Make no mistake. The average, here's a little nugget for you. The average worker only works 2.8 hours a day. They don't work eight hours a day anymore. 2.8 hours. So what do you think they do with the other five hours they're sitting at their desk, <laughs> right? They're scrolling through social. So if you're in social, 10, 10, 10, liking their comment or liking their feed, um, commenting on a post that's important to them, sending them a direct message. I think direct messaging through Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, Facebook in particular, is the best way to reach people. It's better than email, better than phone call, better than text because we all get so much spam, but how many private messages do you get on Facebook? Right? Like a couple of months, maybe. So if you really want to cut through the noise with someone, I'm liking their post. I'm commenting. So they're getting their social proof because everyone's nervous about posting. So I support them. 
And then I sent him a private message. Hey, congratulations on your daughter graduating. That's really special. How's everything else going for you? Oh yeah, you want to buy a house? Um, so just think about that, 10, 10, 10. So two quick things here. Just remember a five-step process. This will kind of make things simple, right? We've talked about being an expert in your knowledge. We've talked about building your personal identity. We've talked about distributing your content across social, but how do you turn social into sales? Five steps. Questions lead to conversations. Conversations lead to relationships. Relationships lead to opportunities and opportunities lead to sales. Questions, right? Remember earlier I said, my spirit animal is curious, George, because I want to be curious. I want to know about you. I want to know about life. I want to know about birds. I want to know about bird seed, right? I want to know about plants. Like I'm just fascinated by people. I'm fascinated by business. Tell me your story, right? Questions lead to the conversations, the conversations lead to relationships. And once you're in the relationship, then you're going to start to see more opportunities and opportunities lead to sales. So if you're only jumping into people and trying, basically, I would call like a last minute funnel where you're just jumping into opportunities and sales, you've really skipped the part of the funnel. <clears throat> you're basically running towards being a discount broker. Like if you're only showing up at the end of funnel for people and there's no relate, there's been no conversations and there's no relationship, then you're racing towards being a discount broker. That's a tough one. Let that sink in for a little while. What you want to do is get your content out there and ask great questions and, and get into great conversations before people are in that stage where they're actually actively looking and selling. And that way you've already won, you've already won the opportunity. But if you're jumping in bottom of the funnel with people, like a lot of times it's too late and you end up discounting. Um, <clears throat> so here's some metrics. This is across, this came from a study uh, from an author, what experts say, and then I'll wrap up uh, 860 different sales organizations, same metrics, 10 meetings, equals five appointments, equals two opportunities, equals money. So meetings would be me and Tanya are going to having coffee, taking my friend to happy hour, talking a little business. But for every like 10 kind of business meetings, I'm going to find five buyer or seller appointments. And about of every five buyer or seller appointments, I'm going to find two legitimate opportunities. So what you guys need to do is reverse engineer like if you want X amount of sales, revert back to like how many meetings you need, how many buyer or seller appointments, and then that'll lead to the opportunities and the sales. So here's my recommendation for the next 90 days. One, find your voice. Find your voice. It's not going to be perfect. And you are you are a, a blooming business person, right? Your voice is going to change. Your Adam's apple is going to drop as you get more weathered in the industry. But figure out like, what is that personal brand right now? You don't have to make decisions for the rest of your life, but what is your brand right now? Master the information flows. What podcast are you listening to? What um, Twitter, again, back to Twitter. Who are you following on, on uh, YouTube and Instagram? Like who are the influencers? Where are you getting your ideas from? Master those flows. Master your local flows. Where are you consuming local information? And then share what fascinates you, all right? Hopefully what fascinates you solves a problem for somebody else. But if you're just sharing what fascinates you on a regular basis, the algorithms will like you <clears throat> and you'll start to get some traction. All right. Let's wrap. What do you think? First time I put this presentation together. So I, that was a little all over the place, but <laughs> hopefully there's a couple of uh, actionable items in there.
What do you guys think? Did you guys find this valuable? What are your nuggets? What's your aha? Out of everything I said, what's one or two things that are sticking out? The ahas are important because it anchors it into your subconscious. When you say things out loud that meant something to you, it puts it in your subconscious and that increases the likelihood that you actually implement it. Love to hear three or four. And then and so, then questions. We can talk about anything. I'm, I'm not in a hurry. For me, I have always said, I'm never going to get a Twitter. Looks like I'm going to get a Twitter. Yes. <laughs> yes. It is actually really hard. I'm tweeting like every day, but use it for information flow. Don't overwhelm yourself with having to tweet yet. Right. You may be inspired I, though. I barely use Facebook, right? And I'm the generation that like, I came from MySpace to Facebook and I'm going to have to go on Twitter. And I'm like, hey, Twitter. So here's my question to you. Would you rather make cold calls every day or spend a little time on social? Yeah, I guess I could. I could. Right. Yeah, I could. Yeah. I mean, we all have options, right? I mean, some people, I've, I mean, out of the hundred agents that have worked at my company, I probably have had 20 or Matt. No, I would say 10 people that love phone prospecting. So, I mean, if that's in your wheelhouse, definitely go for it. But if you catch yourself just avoiding the prospecting all the time, I would argue that everything we've talked about is a nice alternative. What else? And then perhaps working on a blog about whatever, right? And then uh, posting it on your KV core. That way you own that and then people see it because it's technically free if you have a blog, right? Absolutely. It's free. Okay. And then you put your blog into your newsletter. And then next time you have it, say you write like the five things to know to live in Nashville's market. And then next time you get a new client, you just send them a link to your blog, right? So you're repurposing that content. Couple more. Anybody else want to share? I wanted to say first, thank you. It was very informative and I learned a tremendous amount. Really appreciate it. Um, my aha moment was the algorithm for the videos on YouTube, um, looking at how I can gain exposure and that basically, I feel like you nailed it on that. So thank you for that. And I'm going to work on the videos and see what YouTube is liking. And I'm going to yeah. put, I'm going to spread it out on my other platforms. So that was great mm -hmm. advice. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing. Just think okay. when I learned that it was, if I only post once a month, I'm not giving the algorithm enough opportunities to tell me what it likes. So if you set a goal for yourself, let's say 10 videos, instead of trying to do 10 and 12 months, I would shorten that and maybe try to do, you could go ahead and uh, create the videos, but try to post them more frequently and then let the algorithm do its work and tell you which one to niche down on. Uh, what else? Can we have one more? Let's go into your head. Um, Daniel, I'll give you the one more since nobody else is speaking up. Um, I think I like Kyle, Kyle was about to say something. Oh, Kyle? Oh, okay, go ahead. Oh, you're fine. I was just saying the aha moment for me, I'm going to definitely start doing the 10 comments, the 10 likes and the 10 messages um, just to get, you know, how you said the algorithm up to date and to who I need to reach. Yeah. It's amazing how that curates your feed. And when, when you comment on like Facebook, for example, when you comment on somebody else's post, the next time you post, it shows on their feed. Right. Right. Cause, Cause I know like, I like, I like a lot of stuff about food and stuff. So that's what I got on my news feed right now. So I need to do more stuff as far as real estate goes so I can yeah. get more stuff, content There's like that. There's probably a lot of ways to weave in your your love for food into your real estate business. So don't think of them as siloed. How do you work them together? Take an audience on a trip for you to find the best five sushi places in your neighbor in your area. Like if I came to you and like the community that you serve, I said, what's the best restaurant? Like what's your go-to? The food agent. Everybody loves food. All right, Tanya, what about you? Um, I, there's just a couple things that you said was where you use your um, Facebook as your CRM. That was very, that was an aha moment for me because I think that I, I do agree with that, but it's just a different perspective. And marketing is the modern way to build your SOI. Like 
You know, I love how um, you said that, you know, even with COVID and the pandemic that you're like, okay, I'm going to double down or you're going to pay more attention to your marketing and look how it's paid off. Yeah. I mean, we're still, frankly, at the beginning of our journey there. But again, it's, it's when you think about inputs versus outputs, like if I'm going to spend an hour or two a week on something, what's the output? And I, I do believe, and you know, I'm probably not saying anything. None of us, I mean, this is not, not new info. Hopefully I'm just kind of re hope getting you to re-engage and what your social could do for you. Uh, um, but it's the free way. Oh, yes, ma'am. Sorry. Uh, Primper had a print Primper. I think that's how you say it. She had a question about next door. Hmm. Yes. She texted it on there. I don't know if she can speak, but she, she wanted to talk about next door again. Yeah. I, truthfully, I probably wasn't as prepared to talk about next door as some of the other things. Uh, but I do think it's a, it's one of the easier ones and a, a place that you can repurpose your content and be very hyper local. Cause you know, again, we kind of started this discussion about targeting an area, maybe it's a city or a neighborhood or, a you know, sub area, so to speak. But what I think is the most powerful to do on next door is to take your vendor list and promote your vendors. Cause then it shows that you care about the community and you're giving uh, for others. And in fact, you can use that same mechanism um, across all social, but I think next door in particular, Hey, um, here's my buddy, Joe, uh, my roof was leaking and I called Joe and he was at my house in 30 minutes and he did a great job at a fair price. Joe, what are a couple of things you want to share about your business, right? So you're kind of the maestro and you're extracting good info across your different vending partners. So remember a real estate agent, there's about 60 different people that touch every transaction. You know, you've got your insurance agents, your mortgage people, your title people, your, um, your home inspectors, um, your roofers, your landscape guys. So all those people are need to be like in your ecosystem. Like, Hey, I got a guy, I got a girl, like I'm the guy that knows the guy. And so use next door to promote your vendors. And then hopefully that will earn their respect that you're going to get their referrals. But it also just shows that like, hey, man, this girl, like she is out there. She loves she loves where she lives. Like she loves where she lives. She's always providing good content. And then you can jump in and comment when other people are asking. Um, they're like, hey, does anyone know a roofer here? Then you could go back and post that same video or post the same thread about the guy that you were promoting. There's a law. There's In your subconscious, there's a thing called the law of reciprocity which means that if you ask somebody else about themselves enough, then at some point they feel this like guilt and anxiety to ask you about yourself. So question, 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 question. It's all about them. And then at some point, like, well, tell me about you. Like, Oh, why did you ask? It's my moment. Um, so you just think that same concept online that you're just somebody that's always like, what is the best of, best of your area and you bring that to your audience they're going to respect you for it and um i think it'll it'll pay some dividends all right daniel um this has been incredibly informing um and i'm hoping that you guys got just as much value as i did um and thank you so much for putting together a great presentation giving us the google documents i think this is super valuable i'll put them together for you guys and get this this video recording out for you guys and i would encourage you watch it again look at his documents follow the 90 day plan follow daniel on social media and if you're ever in tennessee Look him up and stop by his office. Exactly. We love guests. We will show you around and I will 